Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Liquid-Based Microbiology, Simplify Sample Collection and Transport to Improve Patient Care, presented by Dr. Susan Sharp, Scientific Director, Copan Diagnostics. I'm Christy Julep Labberts and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots and sponsored by Copan Diagnostics. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit copanusa.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box, type in your questions, and click Send. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please use the Ask a Question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Our speaker today is Dr. Susan Sharp. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Sharp. Dr. Sharp, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Christy. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Sue Sharp, and thank you for joining us today for this seminar. And I'd like to thank LabRoots for sponsoring the WebEx and for the venue in which to speak to you today about liquid-based microbiology. We know clinical microbiology is undergoing changes, not only in specimen collection, processing, and incubation, but also in the way we work up our cultures um, with the advent of digital imaging, algorithms, and artificial intelligence. We have a lot of changes coming ahead. And we know clinical microbiology is, chasing, is facing some big challenges out there. We have increased workload associated with hospital-associated infections, testing for the emerging antibiotic resistance of bacteria, laboratory consolidation, and there's a pressure, a pressure for shorter patient length of stay, which means for us, we need to have more rapid results. And we're trying to do all this in the face of decreasing resources. We know we're getting paid less for the tests that we are performing. Laboratory consolidations oftentimes comes with um, additional workload, but not necessarily additional staff to help with that workload. We're facing an aging workforce and retirement from clinical microbiology, and there's a lack of personnel entering our profession. In 2005, the American Society for Microbiology did a benchmarking study, and they surveyed clinical microbiology laboratories for their workload, their productivity rates, and their staffing vacancies. And at that time, 39% of laboratories had vacancies. 50% of those vacancies took three months to fill, and 13% of those vacancies required more than a year to fill. But things are improving. Um, this is a, a similar survey done by the American Society for Clinical Pathology in 2016 to 2017. We can see that the vacancy rate in the laboratory is uh, down to about 6% about three months to fill staff vacancies, but it can take up to a year to fill supervisory roles. And also, this study shows us that over the next five years, and we're one year into that five-year period, over 20% of clinical microbiologists are due to retire. So we definitely need to find some efficiencies going forward. So what does this have to do with specimen collection, which is what we're supposed to be discussing today? Well, clearly laboratories need to find efficiencies, as we stated. Laboratories are under tremendous pressure to perform quality testing, while at the same time limiting additional costs to the medical institution. So laboratories must strategically evaluate each sample and streamline whenever possible. And this certainly can apply to specimen collection and transportation products. This slide I wanted to share with you is a um, picture of the automated core lab line at Kaiser Permanente in Portland, Oregon, um, where I worked up until a couple of years ago. This line hold, runs about 77% of the 13 million annual test volume in this laboratory, and it's all sorted and tested by automation. They have auto loaders in the front of these lines that can each handle 30,000 specimens per day. 
And 80% of the specimens that go onto this line are auto-verified by the LIS, the Laboratory Information System. The technologist never has to look at this result. And that's easy for them to do in, our, in hematology, chemistry, and automated immunology, because all their specimens look alike. They all come in the same size tube, and they all have basically the same consistencies. But we know that microbiology is unique. Uh, we have very challenging specimens. Uh, we receive them in various um, containers um, of various sizes, and this can make it much more difficult to standardize and automate. So we're going to take a look at items that are available to laboratorians that will allow for liquid-based microbiology and learn how these types of specimen collections can help us with the efficiencies in the laboratory that we know we badly need. So let's start by looking at swabs. We know we use swabs for throat collections, wound samples, and vaginal specimens, among other types. Now the state of the art around the 1940s for swabs was essentially what you see here at Q-tip. Uh, this was cotton wrapped around a wooden stick. And the inhibitory effects of the materials used in these swabs had really not been studied. And there was no data on the uptake of the specimens into these swabs or the release of the specimen from the swab. Producing a more standardized approach for collection and transportation of specimens using swabs was really a new concept. And no one had ever really thought much about how to improve this process. And there hadn't been much research done in this area either. The first published standard didn't arrive for another 60 years, but in 2003, the NCCLS, which we now know as the CLSI, published a document known as the M40. It was entitled Quality Control for Microbiology Transport Systems, and it outlined international standards for collection and transport devices. No one had ever really questioned the standard uh, transport swab or how we might be able to improve it, but these new standards created a new performance challenge for swab manufacturers. The purpose of the M40 was to set out guidance criteria for, the, uh, for manufacturers that produce transport devices, including urine specimen containers, blood culture bottles, and collection and transport swabs. These same criteria were also intended to assist end users in assessing the relative performance characteristics of the available collection devices. The essential requirement of this document was to show that the microbiology integrity of a patient's specimen was being maintained in a stable manner during any anticipated transport period or transport conditions. In the case of transport swabs and collection swabs, it was guidance to show that live microorganisms remained viable without a drastic increase or decrease in numbers during transport to the laboratory. Their survival of aerobes anaerobes, and fastidious organisms was assessed for up to 48 hours at either ambient temperature or refrigeration temperatures. And any limitations for a collection device that was found needed to be clearly stated by the manufacturer. Now, with traditional fiber swabs, as shown here, yards of fiber are wrapped around an applicator stick. Now, much of the specimen, when we take a specimen with one of these swabs, it can become trapped in the mattress of the swab, and it is not very efficiently then released into either transport media or onto culture plates, as only approximately 3 to 5% of the specimen can actually be recovered from a collection device like this. Now, in trying to produce a better collection swab, Copan found that the spacing of the fibers on the tip of the swab was important not only to ensure that the specimen is collected as efficiently as possible, but also that the specimen is eluded from the swab in the most efficient manner. And there was also a need to understand the types of fibers that were used, the glues that were used, and the stems, and to determine if any of this might be inhibitory to certain types of organisms or if they could interfere with certain test systems. So the flock swab was invented in 2003. It consists of a unique plastic applicator with a molded rounded tip. And onto this tip, thousands of short strands of nylon are applied in a perpendicular fashion using a flocking process. These flock swabs have no internal mattress core to entrap the sample, 
like we see with traditional swabs. And using a flock swab, the entire sample stays very close to the surface and as much as 90% of the sample automatically eludes from the swab when you touch it to the surface of a plate or when you place it into transport medium. The e-swab is a combination of a flock swab plus one mil of liquid Amy's media and a plastic screw cap tube. E-swabs allow for more than 90% of the specimen to be eluded into the Amy's media. It is used as a collection and transport device for aerobic, anaerobic, and fastidious bacteria for up to 48 hours. Um, and we should note, as uh, is displayed here in the slide, that the exception to this 48-hour rule is with Neisseria gonorrhea, um, but which is stable for up to 24 hours. As flock swabs elute, elute almost the entire sample upon contact with the Amy's media, there is equal sample distribution across all your media plates, which will allow for better growth, better recovery of organisms, and for more isolated colonies. And flock swabs provide a more homogeneous specimen preparation for better and easier to read gram stains. E-swabs not only um, can be used for traditional gram staining and bacterial culture, but they can also be used for automated specimen processing platforms, rapid antigen testing, and many molecular assays. E-swabs can also allow for simplified ordering of supplies and will allow easier training of personnel in the specimen collection process. There's no more confusion regarding which swab to select to use with which test. It can all be the same collection device if you're using a flock swab. This will also mean streamlined processes for the laboratory, as we now will be able to process a single type of swab rather than multiple different types of traditional swabs. As flock swabs collect and release more specimen for routine cultures, they allow us to significantly improve patient test results, again, through better gram stains and the potential for an earlier preliminary patient diagnosis. Plus, as a flock swab contains one mil of liquid Amy's media, they decrease the need for repeat testing due to insufficient sample size. Flock swabs have been shown in the literature to increase the sensitivity of screening assays used in the laboratory. And as an example, the study shown here compared the use of double Dacron swabs with flock swabs in the screening for Staph aureus from nasal cultures. Both types of swabs were collected from 50 healthy volunteers. One of the uh, double Dacron swabs was planted directly onto blood auger and the second was vortexed in 1.8 mil of saline, and then 18 microliters was planted onto a blood auger plate. The flock swab media was planted using aliquots of, eight, again, 18 microliters and also 30 microliters. And all of the plates um, from both swabs, for comparison, were reviewed after 24 and 48 hours of incubation for colonies of Staphylococcus aureus. The sensitivity of the direct Dacron swab was 66.7%. The sensitivity of the Dacron swab that was diluted in saline um, decreased down to 60%. Using the 18 microliters of media from the flock swab, the sensitivity was 47.7%. But with using 30 microliters from the flock swab collection, um, the sensitivity increased to 86.7%. Thus, this study shows that flock swabs, when used in 30 mil aliquots, can detect up to 20% more cases of Staphylococcus aureus nasal colonization as compared to routine swab collection. Now, the purpose of this study was to evaluate whether specimens collected with flock swabs can be used for direct testing of group B strep during pregnancy by molecular assays. The authors wanted to determine if a more sensitive method for testing of group B strep at the time of admission might lead to better detection of colonization closer to the time of delivery. Now, in the study, they used mock specimens, and they were prepared at different organism concentrations to determine whether direct flock swabs um, yielded equivalent sensitivity to routine swab collections, and they compared these to overnight enriched broth cultures as well. 
The top panel shows a positivity rate of four replicate samples at various group B strep concentrations when tested directly from the flock swab media using 500, micro, uh, 500 microliters of specimen in the molecular assay. Testing the flock swab media, they were able to detect organisms down to a level of 1.5 times 10 to the power of two colony forming units per mil. This was compared to the use of the routine rayon swabs, which had been incubated overnight in limb broth, and then tested using 15 microliters of the enriched culture as was specified in the product insert for the test. The results for this were seen in the lower panel. The routine and rayon swabs incubated overnight in limb broth were only able to detect down to the level of 1.5 times 10 to the power of four colony forming units per mil. So this study demonstrated a hundredfold higher sensitivity when using the flock swab collections as compared to routine swab collections and overnight live incubation for the recovery of group B streptococci. This study also showed that the direct testing of flock swabs without overnight enrichment broth was not only more sensitive, but it would, could decrease the turnaround time for test results by approximately 90%. So from 24 hours when you would have to enrich the culture and over, incubate, uh, incubate overnight down to two hours. And this could make it possible to use a very uh, sensitive direct test for women that present to delivery without being pre-screened previously. To support laboratory centralization, which can cause longer transit times for specimens, Tyrell and colleagues looked at anaerobic collection and transport systems to determine if they were robust enough to ensure the viability of anaerobes for at least up to 48 hours. This study looked at classic anaerobic transport system, which consisted of rayon, a rayon swab together with an anaerobic semi-solid amines auger transport tube. And they compared this to the e-swab using a liquid amine for anaerobic organism transportation. They tested 20 fastidious anaerobic organisms that are shown on this slide, and they consisted of nine gram positive and 11 gram negative organisms. And these organisms were from various sources, ranging from oral specimens, such as tonsillar abscesses and facial lesions, sinus and sputum specimens, to abdominal and perirectal abscesses, diabetic foot ulcers, organisms from the, uh, the appendix, stool specimens, and even included sterile sources like blood cultures. The study consisted of using 24 and 48 hour subcultures of each organism that was suspended in saline to a turbidity of uh, a 0.5 McFarland. The suspension was used with each swab system to determine organism recovery at both room temperature and at 40 degrees after storage for 24 and 48 hours. At all sampling times, each suspension was serially diluted, placed onto brucella auger, and incubated anaerobically for up to 72 hours at 37 degrees after which time colony counts were performed. This is a representative example of organism recovery with six of the grand negative anaerobes that were tested in the study. You can see that at both room temperature and at four degrees, when tested um, after inoculation at time zero and 24 and 48 hours of incubation, the flock swab maintained similar or better average viability as compared to the classic anaerobic swab collection. And this same pattern was found when reviewing the results for the rest of the anaerobic organisms that were used in this study. So in conclusion, these authors state that the e-swab is an all-in-one collection device that was shown to provide equal or superior relief, viability, and recovery performance for up to 48 hours at both room temperature and at four degrees with the most fastidious anaerobic bacteria as compared to the classic anaerobic transport system. In addition, they commented that unlike the classic anaerobic swabs with the gel media, semi-solid gel media, the flock swab provided the added ability to be used in automated specimen processing instrumentation. And this study just shows that there was one researcher, they wanted to look at the prevalence of Fusobacterium necrophorum in children presenting to their emergency room with signs and symptoms of pharyngitis. 
They collected e-swabs on all of these um, throats from these children, and they were able to complete eight tests, um, several cultures, um, some point of care assays, and a couple of PCR assays. So again, eight tests were be able to complete, be completed from one e-swab collection. Um, Gandhi and colleagues wanted to look at the use of flock swabs for fungal isolates. So in this study, they tested a total of 19 fungal organisms by, again, making a 0.5 McFarland turbidity standard for each of them, plating these suspensions over time and performing colony counts. They included in the study six yeast isolates, three dermatophytes, five highland moles, which included two aspergillus species and an isolate of fusarium, three zygomycetes, and three dematiaceous moles. Their results showed that colony counts equal to or greater than those seen at time zero were obtained for all of these organisms. And they were able to conclude that the e-swab effectively maintains these fungi for up to 48 hours. So along with aerobic and fastidious organisms, anaerobes and fungi can also be appropriately collected and transported using e-swabs. Now, this is another interesting study, again, performed by Gandhi and his colleagues, that looked at the performance of e-swabs when used to study the viability of non-tuberculous mycobacteria, which can cause skin and soft tissue infections. They seeded various, various concentrations of these five different non-tuberculosis mycobacteria onto e-swabs and tested them at time zero and compared that to um, storage at uh, for 24 and 48 hours at both room temperature and 4 degrees. They found that compliance with the CLSI M40 document was met by all five of these isolates when stored at 4 degrees, both at 24 and 48 hours of incubation. In addition, compliance was also met with all five isolates, tested at room temperature storage, for, again, for both 24 and 48 hours of incubation, which a single exception of Mycobacterium marinum which did show overgrowth, but only after 48 hours of storage. They concluded that the e-swab was shown to maintain these mycobacteria isolates that are known to cause skin and soft tissue infections and hence could be sampled um, with swabs. They were able to show that they maintain them with high efficiency for up to at least 48 hours at both room temperature and refrigeration temperature. So we've just taken a really good look at flock swabs. So now let's take a look at some other new innovative specimen collection and transport devices. And let's start by looking at stool specimens. Currently, after co collecting a fecal sample, a quantity, typically one to two grams of feces, is transferred into a transport uh, media tube, as you can see here, using a spork uh, that's provided in the kit. And this process can be a little unpleasant and a little messy. But with the newly developed liquid-based microbiology collection devices for stool samples, you can transfer the optimal amount of the sample using an e-swab and then place this into a tube which contains your carry blur transport media. There's no messy fork or bulky transport containers to deal with. It also converts the semi-solid fecal matter into liquid suspension for easy laboratory automation. And these devices can also be made to be used as direct rectal swabs as well. These devices can be used for most enteric molecular assays as well, um, including bacteria, viruses, and parasites, any of those products um, that have um, indicate that you can use Carry Blair transport media. This study uh, published last year looked at the recovery of enteric pathogens as well as commensal fecal flora after storage in e-swab for 24, 48, and 72 hours. Again, at room temperature and refrigerated temperatures, and they compared this to storage in routine carry blur media. They also looked at these samples after plating with the Copan WASP automated specimen processing instrument and compared this with plating with a semi-automated isoplater instrumentation, and I'll get back to that in just a minute. At four degrees storage at 24, 48, and 72 hours, both systems showed 100% survival of uh, most of the enteric pathogens. 
with the exception of the Campylobacter species um, in both systems, it showed marginal growth of these organisms at 24 and no growth at 48 hours. And we know that Campylobacter can be very finicky organisms in trying to maintain them. But the real large difference was seen with room temperature storage. At 24 hours of storage at room temperature, the fecal swab recovered six out of seven organisms at the same inoculum seen at zero hour plating. And this was compared to the Carrie Blair medium in which only two out of seven organisms were recovered in the same quantities as the zero outer plating. At 48 hours of storage, the fecal swab showed one log increase for Salmonella typhi, Yersinia, and E. coli. And this compared to the routine Carrie Blair medium, which showed overgrowth of three log or more increase with these same three organisms. Now this graph looked at and showed the comparative growth of the normal fecal flora between the two collection devices. Again, not much difference is seen at four degrees as shown on the right side of the graph. However, at room temperature, although the fecal swab showed increases of 12% and 144% after six and 24 hours, respectively, um, this was compared to increases in the Carrie Blair media at the same time periods of 290 and over 500%. So these authors concluded that the fecal swab was superior in limiting the overgrowth of commensal uh, flora, especially if specimens are being held at room temperature, and that the chance of isolating single colonies of pathogens was greater in specimens stored in the fecal swab as it showed less overgrowth of the fecal flora. This is a study that was done by Kim Chapin and colleagues who looked at the performance of liquid-based fecal swabs in a pediatric emergency department. The objective of this study was to evaluate the use of the uh, rectal flock swab collected at the time of the patient visit and compare the results of this collection method to the results of stool samples that were submitted in Carrie Blair medium. The assay used for, comparison, or for comparing these two collection methods was a multiplex molecular panel for the rapid detection of gastrointestinal pathogens, the biofire assay. 190 rectal flock swabs and Carrie Blair stool specimens were collected at three separate hospital sites, and these were compared. Overall agreement between the paired collections for pathogen detection was 82%. There were 32 additional pathogens that were detected only from the Carrie Blair stool specimen and an additional 26 pathogens that were detected only from the rectal flock swab. So these authors concluded that the performance of the rectal flock swab collection device was comparable to the routine Carrie Blair, Carrie Blair collection for the detection of GI pathogen using this multiplex molecular platform. And they stated that the rectal fecal swab would allow for sample collection at the time of patient visit and the generation of actionable results for the majority of significant infections in their acute care setting when a stool specimen could not be provided. We know that Carrie Blair medium contains auger, which is derived from seaweed, which is not an issue for culture as we are looking to grow live organisms. However, when we're using molecular tests, we are looking for a nucleic acids which can be found in non-viable microorganisms. And we know that the high sensitivity of some of these molecular assays may result in false positive results caused by the presence of nucleic acids um, in the seaweed that contain the non-viable organisms that can be found in Carrie Blair. But Copan does vigorous QC testing and has recently announced that the fecal swab will be supplied with a cert uh, certification stating that no detectable levels of nucleic acids of the most common GI pathogens can be found in the medium. Okay, so now let's take a look at collection and transport of sputum samples. And I'm not sure about all of you, but sputum specimens are my least favorite type of specimens to process. Sputum is a viscoelastic semi-solid substance made up of mucus and leukocytes and cellular debris and inflammatory mediators, elastin fibers, et cetera. And it can be difficult to process these specimens onto auger plates or to make gram stains from them as they're so tenacious in their consistency. So oftentimes it's necessary to add a liquefying agent or a mucolytic agent. 
um, to the sputum in order to release the bacteria that may be trapped within that very complex network of sputum. And there's um, a variety of mucolytic agents that exist, but diphyl-3-etol, or DTT, and N-acetyl-L-cysteine are the two most widely used. Uh, these two um, contain a sulfhydryl group that cleaves the dull sulfide bond that links mucin, uh, mucin molecules together, and therefore they decrease the viscosity of the specimen. And studies have shown that sputum uh, liquefaction with low concentrations of a DTT is more effective than N-acetyl-L-cysteine with a 90% reduction in sputum elasticity and a greater number of organisms are recovered. The Snot Buster is a novel collection device that offers uh, DTT liquefying solution in a ready-to-use tube with an effective sputum tool for collecting the most viscous part of the uh, sputum sample. Now, this product can produce less waste. It can be very cost efficient for the laboratory. And we know that traditional sputum liquefying solutions are normally made up in very large batches. Um, they're usually only good for about 48 hours. So every couple of days, you have to make more of these solutions. But with this novel product, which is room temperature stable, it creates a homogeneous suspension of the sputum in the mucus, which, which then can be planted manually or can easily be placed on an automated processing instrument. The, um, uh, media does not affect the morphology of the cells or the pathogen of the gram stain, and it would allow any, uh, for any normal growth of any bacteria that are present in the sample. So there's no messy, bulky reagents to, compare, to prepare, and it's quick and easy um, to liquefy even the most nasty of sputum samples. Okay, so urine is the next specimen on our list to discuss. Ideally, we know that urine specimens should be transported to the laboratory and plated within two hours of collection. However, we know that that's not always possible uh, in many institutions, especially for those um, that have laboratories that might be located off site. Refrigeration of temperature uh, within 30 minutes of the collection is also acceptable storage for up to 24 hours. But oftentimes, even refrigeration of urines is not easy to comply with. And some sites collect an overwhelming number of urines and oftentimes don't have enough refrigerator space to adequately store some of these samples. So due to the issues associated with transport and storage of urine, uh, of urine many laboratories have elected to use um, a collection device or a transfer device that has preservative in it, um, as you can see here. Uh, in the middle, these vacuum cell containers transfer urine into uh, boric acid tubes. Boric acid is the urine stabilizing agent contained in these tubes. And this can be accomplished at the clinic or on the floor or in the core laboratory. But it can still be somewhat time consuming to manage the process of taking the urine and uh, um, putting them each in these vacutainer tubes. Uh, this novel device is called the Uri sponge, and it uses an applicator stick that has two cylindrical shaped sponges with urine preservatives embedded into the sponges. The device is used, to, um, is used by simply dipping the sponge into the collected urine and then placing it into the transport tube. There's no fill line necessary as there is for your boric acid tube. The collection device is designed to allow for the, the exact right mixture of urine and preservative and the sponge will hold approximately two mils of urine. Now the tube will maintain the viability of bacteria at both refrigerated temperatures and room temperatures for up to 48 hours. This is a study that was done by Bob Rennie at Allen Canada that showed that the sponge device, when compared to urine culture paddles, maintained significantly more urinary pathogens and showed fewer mixed cultures and fewer contaminated cultures. In addition, they compared the urine sponge um, to boric acid transport tubes, and they found favorable outcomes with regards, with regards to maintenance of the viability of the pathogens, and the urine sponge also showed fewer mixed cultures. So I think we can now start to appreciate the ability of our colleagues in our core laboratories and how they can test so many samples so efficiently. And with the addition of liquid-based microbiology collection devices, microbiology is also poised to be able to obtain these efficiencies. And I think we can see how these products can change the way we perform microbiology in our clinical laboratories. With the variety of collection and transport containers that are now available, 
Liquid-based microbiology and automation are clearly possible and are currently being used by many clinical laboratories in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. Liquid-based microbiology collection devices will allow for a simplified, streamlined collection to provide better results to optimize patient care. And as e-swabs and other novel collection devices have opened the door for liquid-based microbiology, in turn, liquid-based microbiology has opened the door for automated specimen processing. And Copan's LBM products will allow for the optimization of your automated specimen processing instrumentation. The primary point on this slide is to point out um, that the amount of Campylobacter recovered from stool specimens after the implementation of an automated specimen processor, in this case, it was the Previ isolator, was significantly increased as compared to manual inoculations. In looking at two years before and two years after the implementation of automation, this study showed the recovery of Campylobacter isolates in the pre-automation time period uh, was 29 versus 64 isolates in the post-automation period. Now, coming back to the study we discussed using fecal swabs as compared to routine carry blare collection devices, this study also looked at these specimens um, when placed onto a fully automated WASP instrument and compared the recovery of isolated pathogens to that uh, when um, a semi-automated isoplater instrument was used. The authors uh, also concluded from this study that the um, fecal swab used in conjunction with the WASP instrument was superior to the semi-automated isoplater method in that the WASP provided a higher number of isolated pathogens compared to commensal colonies. They state that this could allow for immediate identification of pathogens without the need for further subculture, which will help us decrease our turnaround time for our results. This 2016 study looked at urine specimens and automated uh, specimen processing. And they demonstrated, among other things, that one, streaking by automated specimen processing instrumentation was superior to manual streaking with regard to the number of isolated colonies. And two, it showed that automated processing can lead to the detection of a higher number of different morphologies, different species, and overall pathogens from urine specimens. And the authors were able to conclude that the results of this study point to an improved quality of microbiology analysis and laboratory reports when using automated instrumentation. In this study, approximately 100 rectal vaginal specimens from pregnant women were collected in parallel using a rayon fiber swab, which was then placed into liquid Stewart's media, as well as collection onto e-swab. Each collection device was used to do two things, directly, uh, directly inoculate culture plates, and then they were placed, um, the specimens were placed into limb broth for overnight incubation. The sensitivity of the directly planted e-swab, which were processed by automated instrumentation, was 93.8%. This compared to the sensitivity of the directly planted rayon swabs that were manually processed which was 87.5%. This is a difference of over 6% in the detection of group B strep during pregnancy screening between these two collection and processing systems. And although the percentages did increase 3% for both swab groups after overnight limb enrichment cultures, that 6% difference in sensitivity remained between the two collection and processing methods even after broth enrichment. Our automated specimen processing also have added benefits. They improve our quality and accuracy of our specimen inoculation. It's always been the same way every time. Again, we talked about getting better isolated colonies for better detection of pathogens, which will decrease our time to results and hopefully improve patient care. It also allows excellent specimen traceability, improved ergonomics, um, due to the decrease in repetitive motion injuries, which hopefully should lead to increased efficiency and productivity by our laboratory staff. The liquid-based microbiology has made automated spot, uh, specimen processing possible, and in turn, automated specimen processing opens another really large door to full laboratory automation in clinical microbiology. 
And this brings us to WASP Lab, which you can see in the picture here. With WASP Lab, you can have those same bulk sorters at the front of the line. As I said, um, we're in the front of our uh, core line at Kaiser. This is for a streamlined specimen loading. It will automatically, it's a bulk loader, you can drop all the tubes in there. It will automatically source the specimens and send them where they need to go. So there's no batching that's necessary. And we know that the WASP allows for customized streaking patterns that can be user defined and that can even perform dual streaks, planting both sides of any biplate simultaneously. After the plates are um, processed by the WASP, they go onto the uh, tracks and are sent to the smart incubators via conveyor track. And we know when, bench are, when our plates are sitting on a bench, they're not incubating. And we know when we come in the morning, we take our plates out, we sit them on the bench, we may do a little QC, we start our workup, we go to coffee, the plates are still on the bench, we come back from coffee break, we work up in some of our cultures, uh, we handle a few phone calls, we take our lunch, we come back, the plates are still sitting on the bench. I think you can see what I'm trying to get at here. Whenever the plates are sitting on the bench, the organisms are growing much slower. However, when we have our organisms in our smart incubators, each plate has a unique location, as you can see here. They're not stacked in canisters 12 or 10 um, auger plates deep. They all get the exact same atmospheric conditions and the same thermal conductivity. This should allow us to read our plates uh, even faster since there's continuous incubation of our plates. Not only are they not sitting on the bench top, there aren't people constantly getting in and out of the incubator changing the environmental conditions on the inside with regard to not only temperature, but also atmospheric requirements as well. So with full lab automation, again, our plates are always incubating. It will allow for more rapid growth of colonies and hence we'll be able to work up our cultures sooner. With full lab automation, imaging is very important. The um, imaging times that uh, the pictures or the images that are captured of the plates can be sent by the user. Um, you may want to have um, images taken of your urine cultures, for example, at 12, 14, or 16 hours. Sputums, you may want to have um, images taken at 24 or 48 hours. But with the continuous incubation that full lab automation offers, I think we're going to see a paradigm shift where we're going to be able to, again, work up these cultures much sooner than we did before. So the common incubation times that we know of now for um, different types of specimens in the laboratory will most definitely decrease in the future. Here you can see that the rather than looking at the um, plates themselves, you look at images of the plates, as you can see here. And then the digital image on the plates are displayed on the screen. Colonies can be selected automatically with instructions for each colony um, and what you want done with that colony. Or the plates can um, be sent uh, for other automatic processes. Or you can get the plates at your bench if it is something you feel like you need to look at individually. Um, there's also colony picking instrumentation that can be used for identification and susceptibility testing. Um, this is a Calibri instrument from Copan that can spot your MALDI plates and then add your matrix to the plate, the MALDI plates, they're ready to go in the instrumentation. Can also prepare a half McFarland standards for both identification and susceptibility testing, as well as doing subculture and ROS subcultures for you. This was um, a, uh, some data from uh, Dr. Carissa Colbreth's laboratory at Tricor Laboratories that wanted to look at the impact of um, uh, lab automation on their FTEs. And they took three different um, chores that they did in the laboratory. They selected urine screening and reading, urine picking and MRSA culture screening to see what difference they could see before they brought on automation and after they brought on automation. Now this laboratory was not using a Calibri picker, so you can see there's no difference really in the time they spent on picking the organisms out of their urines to do more work on. But we see a pretty dramatic difference in the amount of time they had to spend in uh, screening and reading their urines, and also in screening and reading their MRSA cultures. So before and after implementation, they saw that they could normally were spending about 17 hours on these three tasks, and they were able to decrease that down to nine hours a day after implementation of lab automation. 
Here they also wanted to look at um, the, the financial impact for urine cultures. Um, before they automated, brought automation into the laboratory, they were spending on annual labor just to do urines over $90,000 a year. After bringing in the WASP, um, they saw that they decreased that in half. So post-automation, they were spending about $45,000 a year on labor to perform urine cultures. And they also wanted to extend this out, um, looking um, at uh, pre and post WASP lab implementation. And they wanted to project this out to the year 2020. As you can see, they brought on um, their WASP in 2016. And they were able to project this out looking at a 15% growth. They saw that if they had not brought, brought on automation, that by the year 2020, they would be spending over $140,000 in labor just to do urine cultures. But after bringing on the WASP lab in 2020, they expect to be spending much less, half, less than half of that at about $70,000 to do um, the labor associated with their urine cultures. So as automated specimen processing has opened the door to full laboratory automation in clinical microbiology, lab automation itself opens a really big door to digital microbiology, artificial intelligence, interpretive algorithms that can all assist us in how we do workup in our laboratories. COPAN has a software they, where they utilize artificial intelligence and interpretive algorithms, and this software is called the Pheno Matrix software. And we can use the PhenoMatrix software um, to help with chromogenic detection of organisms, urine culture segregation based on colony counts, and colony recognition on standardized media. And this is a whole other lecture to talk to you about the, the advances that this software can give us in the laboratory, which I'd love to give to you someday as well. So we've already touched on um, that Unlike our colleagues in chemistry and hematology and immunology, the microbiology laboratory receives all kinds of specimens in all kinds of specimen containers with all different kinds of consistencies. But with the presentation today, I hope I've impressed upon you that liquid-based microbiology can very efficiently and very effectively handle the vast majority of specimens we encounter each day in our microbiology laboratories. In summary, there's innovation collection devices allow for better specimen collection, ease of supply ordering, and simple training of our users. They allow for multiple tests to be performed from one sample, and they absolutely are leading the way towards automated specimen processing. So from liquid-based specimen collection to automated specimen processing, to the use of smart incubators, full lab automation, including digital imaging, artificial intelligence, and interpretive algorithms, we are very much in a very exciting time in clinical microbiology today. And with that, I'll end here. I'd like to thank again LabRoots for assisting us in putting this webinar together. And most of all, I'd like to thank all of you for listening today. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sharp, for that informative presentation. And welcome to Amanda Schmidt, Marketing Manager, Copan Diagnostics, who will be joining us for our live question and answer session. Now, just a quick reminder to our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click the Send button. We will answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, our first question is, could a red top copan tube be used for both the streaking of blood cultures on the WASP and for the BCID? Okay, thanks for the question. Um, the copan red cap tubes um, are certainly appropriate to be used for blood, cal blood culture aliquots to be used on the WASP instrumentation. And we're pretty sure, and we think that they would also be acceptable um, for aliquots to use for BCID as well. Very good, thank you, Dr. Sharp. Our next question, can fecal swab be used with all multiplex molecular testing of stools looking for gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal pathogens? Yes, fecal swab, um, as stated, contain Kerry Blair medium. So as long as the testing product states that a, a Kerry Blair preserved specimen uh, can be used in their assay, then yes, fecal swabs can also be used. Again, the medium in the fecal swab is Carrie Blair. 
Now, Dr. Sharp, can urine from the urus sponge be used for chemical analysis and microscopic testing? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, the urus sponge can be used for microscopic analysis. Um, however, due to the, the boric acid and the sodium formate um, that is in the sponge, it cannot be used for chemical analysis like your chem strips or your dipsticks, et cetera. Um, and this is the same with um, any urine uh, specimen that you would put in boric acid uh, preservative, um, regardless of what kind of a collection or transport device that you would have it in. Dr. Sharp, what about automation for tissue specimens? Is there a collection device that can be placed directly on an automated processing instrumentation? Oh, another excellent question. We know that um, uh, tissues is something we didn't address. It, it is an issue that we have in the laboratory that would be great to be able to have an automated uh, process for. Uh, currently, there are disposable grinder tubes um, that can be used to um, still manually grind the tissues. And then these grinder tubes can then be capped and placed on the WASP instrument for the automated specimen processing part. So the WASP is able to decap um, the grinder tube, take the cap off, and sample the specimen. It'll sample using a 30 microliter loop and put that on each plate. So although the initial grinding is, stin is still manual, the WASP instrument would be able to handle um, the tube that you, re that you cap and put back on the instrumentation, and it would be able to handle the plate inoculation and the streaking on those samples. Dr. Sharp, let's see our next question. Okay, we've got so many coming in, let me look through here. Now this one's two parts. My lab is interested in moving to eSwab for culture testing and potentially for some of our molecular tests. Um, first part of the question, can you talk about validation or verification work that needs to be done when making the switch? Sure. Um, if you're switching swabs um, for culture and grand stain, say you're switching um, from using your routine rayon or fiber swab to an e-swab, then there's no reason to do a verification. Um, that's just a, a standalone collection device, and you do not have to compare that to the routine swab that you're using now. And if the e-swab is also in the product insert, for any test kit or any test assay, then again, it does not need to be verified separately from the verification you would do for the routine test kit verification up front. However, if there is a, a kit test or a kit assay that does not list eSwab among their acceptable collection devices, then yes, a verification would be necessary as you would be using that kit or that test off of the FDA label. But keep in mind, certainly a director can choose to do any kind of verification testing that they would like, even if it's not mandatory. Now, Dr. Sharp, here's part two of that question. Does COPAN provide any training support for our point of care providers? Oh yeah, absolutely. We, we know that change manage it, management can be a challenge with any kind of a new product that you bring into the laboratory. And we're very happy um, to uh, make available to use instructional guides and videos, as well as um, to have training for your clinicians or your providers or for your laboratory staff on how to use the, the new collection devices. And we can also have someone available to help with any verifications that you may feel that um, you need to do before implementing one of the collection devices. Our next question, can eSwab tube be used for LBC and viral pathogen molecular testing? Uh, again, I'm not sure what LBC stands for, but I'll answer the viral molecular pathogen testing. Again, as I just stated, you can use an eSwab in a, in a viral molecular um, pathogen testing panel if the eSwab has been, um, if the eSwab is in the, the FDA label for being able to use in there along with any other acceptable devices. If it is not listed among the acceptable devices by the FDA, then you would have to perform a verification testing in-house before you could use the eSwab with that particular panel. Okay, our next question. We are not an automated micro lab. What is the best way to plate these various tubes? And do we use loops, swabs, pipettes, or something else? Oh, that's a good question. Um, 
Yeah, you can use any of these, obviously, any of these collection devices, um, whether or not that you have um, laboratory automation to, to do the, the processing for you. Um, the best way to use them, you can, it, it's really up to you. Um, certainly uh, with the urine cultures, you would want to do calibrated loops because you'll want to get your um, urine concentration and your um, uh, colony counts up. up. Um, with your with your urine. So yes, with the urine sponge, you definitely would want to um, uh, use a calibrated loop. Um, with with wound swabs and stool swabs, et cetera, um, you can use you can use a pipette or you can actually use the um, the e swab itself by dipping it back into the um, container between plates. So either way is acceptable. Using a pipette is acceptable um, and putting drops on your plates for your um, manual streaking. Or again, you can do the e-swab, use the e-swab itself for inoculating the plate. But if you are gonna use the e-swab directly, you wanna make sure since the e-swab does elute most of the specimen off of the, um, the uh, swab when you touch the plate, you wanna make sure you're going back into the specimen between each plate. Thank you, Dr. Sharp. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Our final question of the day, I would like to know if it is possible to use the samples recollected from an HPV sampling for both HPV detection and microbiology tests. And that's a good question, and I'm not sure I know the answer to that. So I'm going to kick that over to Amanda to see if she knows. I don't, but we can certainly uh, look into that. And uh, I see we've got the email of that asker, and uh, we'll get that answer for you. Thank you. Now, Amanda and Dr. Sharp, we want to thank you for joining us. And we also want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today. And those submitted during our on-demand period will be addressed via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Now. Before we go, um, Dr. Sharp, Amanda, do you, either of you have any final comments for our audience? Yeah, I would just like to once again thank uh, LabRoots for this opportunity to present this interesting information to you on liquid-based microbiology. And again, thank the audience for listening today. Thank you both. And we'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Copan Diagnostics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Now, that's all for now, and thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time. Goodbye.